cancer is the most common cause of uh, cancer death. And you know that surgical resection is the uh, curative option here, um, and there are modalities such as radical radiotherapy, but all of them present far too late, and all of the squamous cell cancers occur in the central airways. And as you've already been shown, it's widely accepted that the squamous cell lung cancers occur through this sort of worsening cytological, um, morphological uh, aberration, like as the epithelium changes from normal uh, to dysplastic and then to carcinoma in situ. Now, carcinoma in situ um, is abnormal cells still confined within the basement membrane, is not a cancer, and microinvasive cancers are well known as breach of the basement membrane. This all came about by, uh, from Orbach, who in the 50s did post-mortem examinations of the epithelium. And now he basically found there are these very, very distinct lesions within the airway. Some of and they are called either carcinoma in situ, he called them dysplasia. But he found that they were in a very, very high proportion in patients who smoked, in patients who had lung cancer. So he's the first to really describe this causal relationship between smoking, pre-invasive disease, and lung cancer. And then this has been taken further forward by multiple groups, and this is in about two and a half thousand patients who have COPD, so high-risk patients, smokers, who had abnormal sputum cytology, so pre-invasive disease in their sputum. You can see their risk of lung cancer, their cumulative risk of lung cancer is much, much higher. And we've sort of talked briefly a little bit about sort of autofluorescence uh, bronchoscopy already. And because these lesions occur in the central airways, actually it's the most useful way of detecting them. Uh, now I'm afraid my video won't play, but it doesn't matter. But you can see uh, here, this is what the normal mucosa would look like in white light. And when we use a 400 nanometer uh, wavelength, you can see a fluorescent lesion there. And that is where we target our biopsies from. Uh, and that's where we see the pre-invasive disease. Now, Jeremy George, who's a physician of about 30 years, had the sort of foresight in the 90s to see that actually these pre-invasive lesions were quite important and started a surveillance study, a longitudinal surveillance study, where he followed them up very closely with autofluorescence bronchoscopy and CT and sort of did lots of various other biological uh, testing, et cetera, throughout the way. And I'm just going to show you some unpublished data from that. Uh, so of 124 patients who had 15, up to 15 years of follow-up, were all sort of entered, and some of them came out uh, in the mix, but so I've analyzed 77 of the patients. Now let me show you here. So of those 77, 38 developed cancer, and in fact, we detected 64 cancers in total in these 13. Uh, 38 patients. Half were at the index site, so the original pre-invasive site that we found. So 50% of patients who had a pre-invasive lesion developed a cancer at that site. And the others developed slight <coughs> disease elsewhere. So these are either multifocal, synchronous, or metachronous uh, cancers. And this is what, now we group our patients into those who have low-grade dysplasias and low-grade lesions or high-grade lesions. And the high-grade lesions include those who have carcinoma in situ and severe dysplasia. They behave distinctly differently. Um, low-grade lesions people don't, most authors wouldn't really worry too much about and would continue to keep surveillance. Um, but the contention is around the high-grade lesions. Now, in our cohort, uh, of the 52 individuals who had a high-grade lesion at the beginning of the trial, uh, 20, so about half, developed cancer at that site. And this is a, essentially a reverse capital myage looking at the cumulative uh, cancer risk when we split into patients who have high-grade lesions and low-grade lesions. And you can see, so over this long sort of follow-up period, uh, the patients who have high-grade lesions are at risk of cancer. Now, this is all cancers. So patients who have high-grade lesions are likely to also develop cancers in other parts of the lung, so whether it's in the lung parenchyma or in other parts of the bronchial tree. By keeping a really, really close eye on these patients, um, we have shown a huge stage shift. So this is Cancer Research UK data here showing that patients in stage one and two who would potentially be uh, curatively treated for their lung cancer, so as we've already said, is about 20% will present with cure, uh, disease that we can cure. 
And by keeping a close on these patients, when they develop a cancer, with more than 95% of patients, we were able to offer them a curative therapy for, for their lung cancer. Now, the American College of Physicians, they will advocate surgical treatment for carcinoma in situ. The problem is, because they're centrally located, they need really, really extensive resections to get rid of the disease. These patients have COPD, so they also have very poor lung function. And as I've already said to you, the patients develop lots of other lesions in the lung, and so you can't keep on resecting the lung. There has to be a, a strategy of, of trying to deal with these patients. And most importantly, um, that not all pre-invasive lesions progress to cancer. So 50% of our high-grade lesions remained indolent, or they regressed back into a low-grade lesion or normal epithelium. And as I've shown, 50% progressed. But I think it is becoming evident to us and to sort of everyone, and we stand out um, in terms of our cohorts at UCL, so we monitor these patients very closely for surveillance and the other international sort of centers, probably which there are five in the world, um, will treat their patients who have high-grade lesions. And a lot of people have turned to using endobronchial therapies um, because, of course, they are much safer and they are tissue sparing. We're not sending these patients for surgery. There are a whole host of different trials. The problems are that they are, some of them follow them up very short, over a short period of time, so only a few months in some of the cases, which is just not long enough. Some of them combine their endpoints, some of them combine low grade displays and high grade displays. Um, and they all use different treatment modalities. So some people use PET, some people use other thermal ablation or other <coughs> therapies. This is a study published uh, very recently uh, by the VU Medical Center in Amsterdam. And they probably so far have published the highest number of cohorts, so 80% of patients with high grade uh, lesions. And again, they treated with these patients. Uh, but what, they still had a high risk of lung cancer and developed other cancers in other places uh, in the lung. So photodynamic therapy, we've already sort of briefly heard about. Um, it's great because it has tissue sparing. <coughs> it's perfect for these because the lesions are very superficial, so actually we can treat them quite easily. But they do have problems, so I think there has to be sort of all these studies, uh, they use various inclusion criteria, they all have short follow-ups. None of them clearly define the lesions, some of them, and as you can see, for example, here, lesions which are longer uh, tend to have a much smaller response rate. And really, we've been talking all the way throughout this trial about why PDT is not being taken up by, you know, and the problem is there are no, ran there are no randomized control trials. And so NICE are not going to approve any photodynamic therapy unless we are going to show high quality randomized trials uh, for it. So um, with a lot of work uh, and a lot of bouncing back and forth, uh, so Sam James is the chief investigator on the trial. Uh, we finally got this uh, in and it was funded by Cancer Research UK. So this is photodynamic therapy for the prevention of uh, lung cancer. So the hypothesis is that actually treating patients who have high-grade lesions with PDT will reduce the incidence of invasive cancer when <coughs> compared to surveillance alone. And the trial is a phase three, two to one randomized trial. So two patients will receive treatment to one person being followed up. It's an international trial, so it will include the VU Medical Center and Cambridge and Manchester uh, within the trial. And it has a phase two component already sort of in line with it. So we will start the trial with phase two. If there is an efficacy signal, the IDMC will allow us to progress into the phase three trial, where we'll sort of follow them up over a three year period uh, and uh, see when they're developing the cancers. So from referral, they'll have a bronchoscopy and a CT. If high grade lesions confirm, they'll randomize into surveillance or a treatment arm. So the surveillance arm, there'll be 33 patients, and they will undergo six monthly or 12 monthly bronchoscopy depending on the grade of their lesions. And the primary endpoint is progression to cancer. So the patients have progressive cancer, the treatment will be decided by a lung MDT. The intervention patients, they will receive photodynamic therapy. We use Photolon as our photosensitizer, and they will receive two treatments uh, for their high grade lesions. And as I said, there'll be a trial sort of go stop at phase two to decide whether we progress into phase three. 
that will include them also doing annual CT scanning, watching spirometry, but also doing health quality uh, related questionnaires uh, to actually see whether this is a uh, this treatment is cost uh, effective. So this is very briefly the thing, this is just the sort of statistics that we've used. So we're assuming that it's going to be a 20% responsive rate in the phase two trial. Um, and in the phase three, we are looking for a, with the assumptions we've made in photodynamic therapy, we'll see 30% progression, which is in line with what uh, the DU Medical Center uh, in Amsterdam have recently published. And based on our cohorts in the surveillance arm, we're expecting around half will progress into, into cancer. So we're using Photolon, um, and you know, we moved away from photo for maybe about five years ago. Uh, this is because patients have you know, lot less dark toxicity. They, this is, it appears to be um, uh, taken up by tumors very selectively. It's washed out quite quickly as well, and we treat it at 665 nanometers. This is a 16-year-old patient who had multiple cancers in his trachea, and there's a new menectomy that you can see further down in the line. And this is day one post-op. We bronchoscope all of our patients the following day to remove any tumor debris. Um, and you can see the uh, you know, sort of excellent response. And this patient, he was playing on his iPad uh, in the sunlight the day after, and I had it, although he was told not to. Um, and he had absolutely zero problems with photo, with you know, a skin reaction. And we just don't, we don't, we watched them we ask them to sort of be very careful for five to seven days, but they don't seem to have too much in the way of problems with photosensitivity. And this is just very brief. I've already talked about this. So they'll have photos along, they'll have the photosynthetic therapy, um, and then they'll have a second bronchoscopy to remove any tissue, and we'll be doing two treatments. And we're looking for really a response as def defined by a change from a high grade to a low grade lesion. Um, and as I said, uh, we're looking at progression as the, as the primary endpoints. So, um, high-grade lesions uh, in the airway, so carcinoma in situ, they are at risk of progressing into site-specific cancer. We know that, but not all of them do. We, I don't think we should necessarily be offering everyone surgery for these lesions because we, there's no evidence to say that it works. Individuals, um, in individuals who have high-grade lesions, it predicts the risk of lung cancer occurrence. And I really, I do think that photonic therapy will play a role in sort of preventing uh, lung cancer. But I guess that what we don't have at the moment is a randomised trial to prove it. So the trial will open up in two months, um, and will run for three years, and then sort of a year uh, for follow-up after that. So um, these are all the acknowledgements. Uh, Apo Care Pharma, who provide the photo on, who are also going to be supporting uh, the trial, uh, and. Uh, I'm not worried about any of these. <laughs> 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 <laughs>